Now yesterday we got a new trailer for the Ahsoka series, a trailer that kind of looked like it could have also been called something along the lines of a trailer for a live action season 5 of Rebels. Which mind you isn't exactly a complaint for me, from someone who watched that show and for the most part really enjoyed it. Instead it's just an observation and leaves me wondering how much the apparent reliance on that show or knowing what happens in Rebels will affect the interest and eventual viewership of this show of Ahsoka especially from the more casual fans who may not even know there is an animated show called Rebels and certainly won't go back and watch it to get context. And I mean, the trailer alone already kind of seems to depend on you having a clue as to who all these characters are for you to get what's going on in it and why you should be excited for these characters and the story or adventure to come. Why you should be excited or worried about this um, blue guy named Thrawn and the hunt for someone named Ezra Bridger. And again, as someone who watched Rebels, not to mention has read and enjoyed everything Thrawn's ever been in, as well as who knows Clone Wars, which is the sort of start of all of this, or the start of Ahsoka's story, and thus I immediately get a lot of the connections or mentions to Anakin, for example. Anyway, as someone who got all that and more out of the trailer, who noticed some of the other things we'll talk about in a bit, well, from my point of view, the trailer looked fantastic. This has gotten me even more excited and hopeful, fingers crossed, for the series that's now a little over a month away and will, as we learned, kick off with a two-episode premiere. But if you don't know all that, if you've never seen Clone Wars or Rebels and know little to nothing about these characters, you might be really confused right now. And the one friend I talked to who watched the trailer, and granted this is anecdotal, but the response was, looked cool but I didn't get it. And the first question they asked was, and I quote, What's up with the orange lightsaber people? Which I actually think is probably a good place to start talking about the actual trailer and leave this question of understanding and viewership alone for now. That'll one way or another be answered in time. It'll be answered when the show finally comes out. And so to talk about these orange lightsaber people, also known as Balon Skull, who is a former Jedi and his apprentice Shin, well, I think the trailer may give us some pretty big clues or hints as to what they basically are, with that hint being when, right at the start of the trailer, Balon says war is inevitable and that one must destroy in order to create. He then caps it off by saying, well, he says a line we've basically heard Ahsoka say at one point or said to Vader during their duel in Rebels. He says, we are no Jedi. You then take some of the comments made by the late Ray Stevenson, who plays Balon, about how his character is an evil, that he's not going to go out of his way to hurt or kill people, but he will do what he has to do when someone gets in his way. Then you factor back in those orange lightsabers, which yes, are supposed to be symbolic, I think. They're not quite red for Sith, and they're not quite yellow, a color we've, for example, seen Jedi Temple Guards use. And I'm very much starting to get a greater good at any cost vibe from them or a sort of Thanos-ish vibe where there's something they feel they must do despite the cost some may have to pay to see it happen. And this, I suppose, could connect to the world between worlds, which I think we're kind of seeing some clues of in the trailer. We're seeing some of the same symbols and such in the trailer. And then trying to or wanting to use it in order to change something that happened in the past, or, you know, maybe alter a future that they've seen, maybe stop it from coming to pass. Though, no, I don't honestly think this series will retcon the sequels or anything like that. The announcement of the Ray movie pretty much shut that idea down for good, or for as long as Kathleen Kennedy is still president of Lucasfilm, and as long as that movie is still on the horizon, which are two things I think kind of go hand in hand. Either way, let's not focus on or worry about that right now. And honestly, if I'm right here, if this is a kind of greater good at all cost thing with these characters, well, it's an idea that I don't hate as long as it's done correctly and done well. As long as we don't imply these are truly some kind of gray Jedi using the light and the dark simultaneously, and that it's the right way to balance the force or some such nonsense. And watching these two kill a bunch of New Republic officers in the trailer tends to imply that whatever they are, it's not going to be the right or the correct way. But anyway, yeah, I'd be fine with something like this. I just talked a few days ago about Quinlan Voss and his story in Legends and how he had to kind of walk the fine line between trying to do good and doing what is right, but having to battle or find, in his case, this evil that was out there one that will not limit itself with what it's going to do or willing to do to accomplish its goal. It's kind of that dilemma of good. You're facing an opponent that will not put restrictions on itself like you will. 
And so it could potentially be rather interesting to see these characters having willingly crossed that line to do whatever they must to accomplish their goal for good, that they feel they must, I don't know, fix something that has gone wrong or stop something from happening, whatever it might be. As I said in that aforementioned other video about Quinlan Voss, I think that's an interesting area for Star Wars to explore. I think it's one that it naturally should kind of explore. And it's one that Andor has been exploring, and it's been doing a fantastic job at it. But moving on from that for now, I think we have to talk about Sabine next. Since she almost seemed to be as much of a focus in the trailer as Ahsoka was. Which I suppose makes sense because of her connection to Ezra. We even see her and hear this time that last message he left her before the uh, Pergil whisked him away. And it's also quite clear she's going to go on this adventure with Ahsoka, that they will be working together in this. So again, it makes sense that the trailer would focus rather heavily on her. However, maybe the most interesting part about all this is this perhaps indication that Sabine is force sensitive and was being trained by Ahsoka at one point. Which I'm not entirely sure is what's really going on or if it's not just something that throw us off for reasons that they just kind of want to mess with us. I mean, for one, Sabine was never ever even hinted at being force sensitive in Rebels, even when she was trained to use the Darksaber by Kanan and Ezra. They didn't seem to sense any force ability in her at that time. And kind of speaking of the Darksaber, which she learned to use rather well in Rebels, she does have Ezra's green lightsaber. He left it with her at the very end, right before he went to stop Thrawn. And we see her using it in the trailer. So it's quite possible that the only training she was getting from Ahsoka was more lightsaber training in the same vein Ezra and Kanan were giving her. Not any kind of actual Force or Jedi training. Shin even yells at her at one point in the trailer that she has no power, which I'm assuming is referring to her not having the Force, but trying to fight her anyway. However, there was also that part where Sabine is holding out her hand, which could just be her way of kind of wanting or hoping someone stays back or stops approaching. And it does seem to be the same location her fight with Shin is taking place in. So it could just be her down and trying to almost plead with Shin to not kill her or something along those lines. Or it could also be her trying to use the force against her, I suppose, to force push her or something along those lines. It could be her knowing she has this ability in her and finally trying to unlock it. Though considering we already kind of have one Mandalorian Jedi type character running around these days, that being Grogu, I'm not really sure we need another. So I hope this is just kind of some clever editing and misdirection in the trailer to mess with us fans for reasons. And speaking of that sort of thing of misdirection in a way, we then move on to Shin asking what happens when we find Thrawn and Balin responds, power such as you've never dreamed and I do think this is edited a bit I don't think he's implying Thrawn is the power they're looking for or that he will provide power or anything like that I don't even think they care so much about finding Thrawn as much as they care about finding or getting to wherever he is that's what or where this power Balon is speaking of is wherever Thrawn and Ezra have been taken to by the Pergil and the orange saber people are only working with Morgan Elsbeth mainly because they're trying to get to the same place, so they're kind of allies at this point. But they have different objectives and different reasons, again, for finding Thrawn. I also think Hera is worried about these whispers of Thrawn's return that Ahsoka has heard and brought to her, and that Thrawn will somehow return and organize the remnants of the Empire that the New Republic doesn't seem all too worried about, maybe not as worried about as they should be. In other words, I think there's clearly a few different kind of plot points that will be in play for the series that will all be connected to some degree, or connected for the most part. The one thing that I'm not so sure about at all is the Inquisitor we once again see, and we get a kind of better look at them with the spinning dual-bladed lightsaber and all that, though hopefully there will be no saber coptering. And the reason why I find this so kind of curious is at this point in time, some five or six years after the original trilogy, assuming this isn't a flashback, which it doesn't seem to be. Well, there really shouldn't be any Inquisitors running around anymore. None of them left. So could it actually be something or someone else entirely that has simply gotten their hands on some Inquisitor gear? Or maybe is kind of one of their kind, but maybe a bit different or special somehow? Could that be Barriss Offee we're seeing? 
Honestly, that'd be one of the only things that would make sense for the story, but at the same time, not make sense for the story, because, again, going back to what I was talking about at the top, about confusing the more casuals, are they really going to put Barris in this story too? Because I feel like it would take quite a bit of explaining as to why this is or should be a significant opponent for Ahsoka to face. You have a lot of kind of history between the two to cover. And at the same time, I don't see how or why she'd relate to anything else going on in this story. I don't know why she would be working with the Empire or with Thrawn or with the orange lightsaber people. I just don't see how this Inquisitor connects to anything yet. Another possibility with this Inquisitor, which would be kind of a major curveball and a highly, highly unlikely one, would be that it's Mara Jade. I mean, with all this talk about Heir to the Empire and it clearly being inspired by that to some degree, or what they're doing with the Mandoverse in general being inspired by that. She is, I suppose, a possibility. I mean, can you really do this story right without one of its most key players? Again, I highly doubt that, but who knows? Filoni does like to surprise us and from time to time give fans what they want. Though, as I've discussed before, I don't know that fans want Mara Jade brought into this considering how things are going to go with Luke. But who knows? Probably not going to happen. But it is a remote possibility, I'd say. Either way, moving on and touching on just a few final things quickly, I did find it very interesting that Balon apparently knew Anakin, and that was only one of a few references to him, which makes sense since, again, many out there are not going to know about the connection between Anakin and Ahsoka. They're not going to know she was his Padawan. And so you do kind of have to explain that to really begin to understand Ahsoka's character, since Anakin is such a huge part of her life. We also then got a glimpse of a statue, or I suppose it was more of a wall relief, that seems to be in whatever this temple is that Ahsoka goes to. And it had a vague resemblance, perhaps, to the Force Priestess seen in the Yoda arc of Clone Wars. I mean, it's probably not one and the same, but maybe. Maybe there's a connection between her, the world between worlds, Mortis, and all of these sort of things that is going to be alluded to. There was also then Sabine cutting her hair, just like Kanan once did, as well as a glimpse at a live-action Pergil again. There was even a nod to the old vintage Kenner R2-D2 action figure, which was kind of cool coming from someone who had that way back in the day when they were a kid. And so, all in all here, an awesome, awesome trailer. If you're a fan of Rebels, this is a dream come true for the fans of that show who have been left hanging. Ever since the epilogue we got in the final episode, the one that showed us Sabine and Ahsoka ready to go and find Ezra, and then just ended. For everyone else, well it's hard to say exactly what you thought of this one, which is what you're now invited to do in the comments below. Tell me what you thought of the trailer. Well, that's all I got for you this time, and as I just said, now it's your turn to take to the comments below and tell me what you thought. Tell me how excited or not excited you are for this show. And how much you know about Rebels, and how much you feel like that impacts how much you care or don't care about this show. Either way, leave those comments below and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.